All right, let's get started. I hope everybody's having a great reInvent so far. reInvent is all about connecting with people, which I see people doing, and learning a lot. And I hope in today's session you're going to learn plenty that you can take back to wherever you're from and apply in your organization. So we'll start with just some quick introductions. Um, Bianca, you want to go first? Yeah, hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Bianca Langford. I'm a VP of Cloud Security at Warner Brothers Discovery. Been in the cloud space for a good six, seven years. Awesome. My name is Andrew Blackham. I'm a product manager from the team behind AWS Organizations and very focused on enterprise governance and controls that you can put in place to help manage your environment. And we'll get into that a lot today. Steve. Great. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Rice. I work on AWS Systems Manager. I uh, specialize in AWS App Config, which is a feature flagging service. We're not going to talk about that much today, but happy to connect with you about that later. Um, and today's session is called Best Practices for Organizing and Operating on AWS. So it's a cloud op session. Um, and as I said, we're going to be covering best practices, as the title says, um, and also have some cool real world examples from Bianca about how some other organizations are using some of these tools. All right. So um, at Amazon, we talk to a lot of customers, we listen to a lot of customers, um, and, and spend an, a tremendous amount of time sort of getting in the shoes of our customers. And, and this is a really common scenario that we hear about inside of Amazon. So they'll be uh, just making their way to the cloud, and they'll start off uh, with an account, a single account, and they'll put some workloads into it, and they'll put a user onto it, and soon they'll add more users into that account. And then they start seeing the need, as things scale, to create a second account. Um, maybe there's some permissions that need tweaking um, in the second account that are different than the, the first account. So they'll set up the second account and add users to that. Um, configure everything correctly for those two accounts. But again, things are still growing and scaling. And soon, before you know it, you have a lot of different accounts. Um, all similar, slightly different, and your finance team is probably saying, well, wait a minute, what are all these accounts? Do we need them all? What are they for? And um, because things have grown very quickly, we hear from our customers, there's a little bit of confusion. Uh, that they hadn't done quite enough planning ahead of time, and that's really what we're going to talk about in the session is how to think ahead. So just as a rhetorical question, um, I'm going to ask you, how would you describe your cloud environment? Um, this is not a picture of the Venetian. It looks like it could be taken here. Uh, but this is a beautiful building. You can see uh, nice straight pillars. You can see windows. Everything's very well organized. It's well thought out. There's amazing glass ceiling. Um, but in reality, what we hear about, and I've worked at some other companies that were AWS customers, is that our cloud environment looked a little bit more like this. Yes, there are windows. Yes, there are doors, um, maybe a pillar here and there. But this really probably is a better representation of our cloud environment. And that's, that's very common. Um, there are some things and best practices that we're going to talk about that will help you so that you don't end up in this and you end up with the previous one. Um, I am going to take a 5,000 meter view uh, for a second about cloud operations. This is a cloud ops talk. Um, if you are going to other talks in the cloud ops uh, track, you'll see this same slide. Um, and it talks about really thinking about your journey and getting engaged in cloud operations. Um, there's some great stats here. The one that really uh, resonates the most with me is the one around business agility, a 37%, that's a third, uh, decrease in time to market. You know, speed in our industry, speed really matters. And Andy Jassy has a quote that speed matters disproportionately to our customers to scale. And, uh, and that's just so true. Moving to the cloud will really help you move faster. Um, App Config is uh, it's near and dear to my heart. It's, uh, it's all about moving fast and getting you faster to market. So, um, But some really great stats here. And then again, just in terms of your journey onto the cloud, it's not a magic wand that you wave and everything's done. It is a journey. And uh, there's multiple steps along the way. Um, if you look at this slide, the setup on the left, we're going to talk about that. And then the uh, operate on the right, we're going to talk about that. We're not going to talk as much about building and migrate, although Bianca will have some examples on that. But that's really sort of anchors our talk. Um, so that first thing, when we're talking about scaling, we're going to zero in on those three sections. Um, I imagine in the crowd we have some people that are at startups that are worried about scaling. In the crowd, I also imagine we have some enterprises that are having some scaling pains as they may be doing mergers and acquisitions, as they're just growing organically. And so um, elements of scaling is going to be something that we, we dive deep into. Um, as I mentioned already, Bianca from uh, Warner Brothers Discovery is going to be here talking about what it really means to implement some of these things. And then we'll end with some 
best, very clear best practices. They'll be sprinkled throughout the, the talk too, but we'll end with some best practices as well. So I alluded to this before, but really the idea of uh, scaling successfully is to plan ahead, <laughs> to set things up now so that later they're okay. And it's really tough to do that. We struggle with this inside of Amazon. Um, you don't, you have to make some assumptions now. You can't always predict the future, um, but sometimes moving slower at first helps you move faster in the future. So um, that's a theme that you'll see throughout this whole presentation. Uh, again, breaking this down into structure, security, and operations through this talk. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew, who's gonna talk to you about structure. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. So when we talk about a structure, we want to think about building a building. That's just the easiest way for me to kind of understand what's going on when it comes to building your cloud environment. It's, it's a little more fluid in your cloud environment, right? But at the same time, you are building somewhat of a structure that your users and developers can work in. And so thinking about building a building, you have multiple different elements. You want to think about the bricks, the material that you know, is essentially what your building is. You want to think about the framework or the structure that kind of defines what your building looks like. Once you have your building finished and even as a part of the construction, you want a building manager who has all the tools that he needs to to be able to manage that building efficiently. And then you also want to have a pretty, you, have, you want to have a developed security system, something that you know, is able to lock the doors, keep people out that don't need to be in it, and then also has visibility throughout the building as well to ensure that everything that goes on is, is, should be, is as it should be. So thinking about the bricks in our cloud environment, you want to think about the accounts, that AWS accounts is building blocks. And we always have to come back to the concept of what an AWS account is because we, as we continually discuss with customers, accounts can sometimes be utilized in ways that aren't quite as efficient. So usually within AWS, you can build instances, like you can create these instances, create these cloud environments, quickly sort of wind them up and wind them down, and that flexibility is awesome. When it comes to kind of creating additional accounts, you want to be a little more explicit about how you're creating and scaling across accounts. The reason why we recommend scaling across accounts is essentially when you hit a limit within a certain account, that is the way to scale across some of those limits. There's quotas within accounts. When it comes to security, operating across accounts give you natural isolation boundaries. As I create another account for a different project or a service, it's not, it's not connected to my other accounts by default. The access isn't connected to my other accounts. If there's an issue in one of my accounts, it's isolated to that account. And so it's a natural isolation boundary as you build additional accounts within your environments. When it comes to sort of compliance or business processes, if you need, say, a certain workloads to be compliant based on certain regulations, you can create accounts and build those accounts to be compliant. So it gives you a lot of that sort of flexibility in terms of building your environment for specific needs. Essentially, you want to think of an account as a resource container, and the resources that it contains are, are your resources. It's not any given user, it's not any sort of specific niche thing, it is resources that you develop, services and applications that serve your customers. So with our bricks in place, we want to talk about the framework or the structure that helps sort of align and categorize our bricks. And that's where we want to talk about OUs or organizational units. So organizational units are that structure that put your accounts in place and give, them a, give, give yourself the ability to be able to customize different environments within your larger AWS environment. So you need those supports in place to define the pattern for your bricks. When you design your organizational unit structure, when you design sort of your environment, you wanna start small and then expand. You're gonna hear that a lot during the presentation today. We're gonna talk about some patterns that we recommend, but in any case, wherever you're starting, Start small and then expand from there. You want to consider designing around security and operational needs and maybe not around business users. The reason why is because you apply guardrails and policies to these OUs. So you build these custom environments and you put the protections in these environments that help dictate what actions take place. So I want to talk about some common anti-patterns at this point in time because again, we have a lot of discussions with customers and there's a lot of discussions we have when customers have sort of built a model that isn't quite scalable. So if you're trying to build your structure around business teams, or if you design OUs around your business teams, those business teams fluctuate a lot. You know, an owner of account, an owner of a team might not be the same owner tomorrow. You know, management changes, teams change. And so you want to consider designing your organizational units or your accounts around applications and services and security, and not necessarily around your business teams. The other common thing that we've seen, especially for software providers, is they want to build accounts for each customer. When they have a new customer, they build another account for that customer. 
And again, the, reason, the rationale against that is it can be hard to manage hundreds of accounts. Your customers fluctuate. You might be limited in the number of accounts you can have in the organization into thousands of customers. Um, it's not easy to easily create thousands of accounts and then try to decommission them if your customers you know, aren't paying you or aren't utilizing the services. And so again, you want to think about accounts as resource containers for your resources. And then when it comes to customers, you want to consider other elements to be able to get them access to the resources that you have instead of replicating it, creating multiple accounts, and getting to a point of where it's really hard to scale because you're doing an account per customer model. Again, start small and build from there. If you don't have any structure, if you don't have any organizational units, start with one and then expand to others. So what do we recommend? Here are some, here's four OUs that we recommend for every customer and that seems to work well for every sort of business. And then we'll talk about a few others after that. First and foremost with the native US, you want to think about your security. So we recommend a security OU. This hosts the accounts that manage the security aspects of your environment. We're going to dive deep into this later, so I'm going to skip over it now. The infrastructure OU hosts the accounts for the infrastructure of your environment. So network services, shared services, <laughs> those all belong in the infrastructure OU. There are two additional OUs that we think make sense for all customers. The Sandbox Organizational Unit, and that hosts all the accounts that are built for your developers to test things out, for developers and other teams to test things out without being sort of limited within your other organizational units that may have policies applied, right? So we, will, we recommend if you create the Sandbox Organizational Unit that as you give accounts to developers, you wanna ensure you understand what's going on in those accounts. You wanna potentially set some budget limits so that they don't run up huge bills in, in their Sandbox environment and then have it disconnected from your network. Again, you want to give your developers the freedom to explore services and explore what AWS can do, and this is sort of a safe place to do that. And then finally, the workloads organizational unit, and this is likely the place where you're gonna scale across multiple different accounts. You can create nested OUs within organizational units. So within the workloads OU, we recommend nested OUs that reflect your software development lifecycle. So dev, test, prod, OUs, and then we also recommend that you can sort of create an account per lifecycle stage with all of your applications. And so you'll likely have lots of accounts within the workloads OU, but it separates your environment, gives you the ability to protect your production workloads, and then continue to allow you to scale into additional applications and services as you grow. We're gonna run through six more additional OUs, so stay with me, I know we're talking about a lot. And again, if these don't make sense for your business, I don't recommend that you add 10 OUs right off the bat, right? These are just ideas that we've seen from a lot of customers and we think work for a lot. The policy staging OU is where you test out policies before you apply them to your organization. And we're gonna come back to this a little bit later, so I'll skip over for it now. The suspended OU is where accounts sit before they're deleted. So when you have accounts that need to be decommissioned, that are no longer in use, and you're not at the point of where you wanna delete them yet, you can add them to the suspended OU, then create a policy that maybe limits any AWS action there, and that just sort of gives you a place to safely host those decommissioned accounts before you delete them. If you have individual users within your organization that, have, that need accounts, I think of specifically business users, someone who needs a prototype for sales, or some, maybe a business analyst team who needs a place to host all their tables, you might want to have individual users' accounts within a specific OU, and they're sort of self-defined outside of your you know, workloads and resources. It's a place for you to pay attention to those. The exceptions OU is for account-level exceptions that don't really fit within the rest of your environment. So these are like highly customized places, say a new beta product or a new product that you want to explore, where they require highly customized policies that don't really apply to the rest of your environment. Again, this is a place to sort of isolate all of those accounts so you can pay attention to what's going on there and then recognize that it doesn't really fit the rest of your environment. The deployments OU is for your C the accounts that host your CI CD pipelines. And then finally, the transition OU. This is something that we recommend nowadays where there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions going on. There's a lot of cases in which accounts will come in and out of your organization. The transition OU is the place where you can host those accounts and test out the functionality, test out all of your policies, and ensure that they'll fit within your environment before you move them into the workloads, to the security, to the other places within your organization. All right, so we've talked about our accounts. We've talked a little bit about our structure. Let's discuss a little bit about the building manager. And I've been talking about aspects of AWS organizations, but specifically the service itself allows you to build that structure. It's where you create accounts and organizational units. 
An organization has three specific elements. Your management account is where you administer your environment. The root sort of defines the boundaries of your organization. It defines which accounts are in your organization. The organizational units we've talked about, and then of course all the member accounts sort of fall within those organizational units. Because the management account is used for the administration of your environment, we highly recommend that you keep that management account secure and you delegate responsibilities outside of the management account whenever possible. When it comes to building or automating your building, if you're not familiar with AWS Control Tower, it's a governance service that's built on organizations and a number of different AWS services that help follow AWS best practices and help you to apply them to your environment automatically. So it's something to investigate. If you're not sure where to start, if you haven't thought about governance or structure or anything like that, investigate more about Control Tower as they automate a lot of these best practices that we talk about today. And then if you are familiar with organizations, but you haven't been keeping, you haven't been keeping aware of what's been going on, as of this year, you can now close accounts from your management account within the organization. Although be aware that you can only close up to 10% of active accounts within your organization. Again, we talk about scalability. Having to close a large number of accounts is limited by this API. There's account management APIs that allow you to manage the central contact information or alternate contact information for member accounts within your organization. Recently, within this past month, we now support AWS CloudFormation where you can create and manage your accounts, your OUs, and your policies all using stacks and CloudFormation with Infrastructure as Code. That just came out earlier this month. And there's not a slide on it, but we just released delegated administration for policies, I think, as of this past Saturday. So apologies it's not in here, but that also has come out recently this year. All right, we're going to table the building manager, come back to it in a sec, but let's talk a little bit about the security system that you're going to want in your environment. The best practices we recommend when it comes to security for your environment is, one, employ proactive security mechanisms, and then two, ensure and equip your security team with visibility and controlled access to everything that they need. When we talk about preventative controls, the preventative control that we have in place for most customers is service control policies. SCPs allow you to create and apply custom guardrails to your organization. Again, we've talked about OUs. We talk about applying custom policies that dictate actions that can be taken within accounts. This, on the slide here, we have a simple policy here that denies the ability for any member account to leave the organization. This is a, if you haven't used an SCP before, this is a great way to start. It's a simple SCP that you can apply to an account or an OU. You can try to have your account leave the organization and it will be denied based on that action. You can, the interesting thing about SCPs is it denies actions on accounts. So it's another fail-safe measure that if someone potentially has administrative capabilities in any given account, you can still apply a policy that denies the ability for them to take an action that you don't want taken in that account. You can apply SCPs to member accounts, the OU or the organizational route, and then the policies are inherited at lower levels, levels of your organization. If you're, again, familiar with AWS Control Tower, if you're not familiar with AWS Control Tower, they have a feature called preventative guardrails that are exactly that. They're SCPs, but they're managed SCPs that are managed by the Control Tower service that you can easily apply to your environment. Let's talk about some common use cases for SCPs. First, you can use common services within HOU. So again, if you think about a security OU, they have the need to use security services, but maybe not all the other AWS services that exist out there. So you can create a policy for them and deny use of other services that don't apply to their organizational unit. If you have any region-based limitations or re region-based requirements, you can create SCPs that deny the ability for your users to create resources in, in regions that are not allowed. If you want to require that tags are on resources before they're created, you can create an SCP that denies the resources that can be, it denies the ability for resources to be created if proper tags are not applied. You can specify allowed instance sizes. This can be for maybe a sandbox OU when you're trying to ensure that costs don't run up. This is a security policy where you can prevent actions from root users. You can prevent the deletion or modification of IAM roles as well. Again, another security policy and then preventing default encryption from being turned off. There's a number of different things you can do. These are common use cases that we see from customers for security and usability, and that's why we recommend it. Start small, build from there. When it comes to designing service control policies, you wanna start with broad level policies at the high level of the organization, and then you wanna have more specific policies within lower levels of your organization. So a good example is, again, allow EC2, all instances at the organization level, 
but maybe limit it to smaller sizes within specific OUs where they don't need huge EC2 instance sizes. You can use SCPs to help sort of, to help adhere to compliance standards that you might have. And then when it comes to testing SCPs, we can again revisit the policy staging organizational unit, where within this organizational unit, you can create nested OUs that reflect your organization structure. And then you can test SCPs there, ensure that they have their intended impact, and then apply them to the place in the organization where they're going to reside. The second thing we talked, as so we talked about preventive controls, the second thing we want to talk about is central access and consolidated findings. When it comes to central visibility, we recommend that you employ the ADBIS security services that exist across your organization. So there's two specific accounts within the security OU that we recommend. The log archive account is where you host all of your CloudTrail logs. And within CloudTrail, you can ensure that all the actions that are taken within your environment are logged. And then you can delegate the administration of CloudTrail to this specific account. So again, your security team operating within this account can have visibility across your entire organization in terms of what goes on. And then the second account we recommend is a security tooling account. So when it comes to ADBIS security services like Guard Duty or Security Hub or IAM Access Analyzer or Detective or Inspector or a number of others, you can enable the service at the organization level and then you can delegate the administration of the service to that security tooling account. Again, this is an account in your security OU that your security team can use to see what goes on and to see all the findings from the AWS security services that exist and take actions on those findings. So when it comes to setting up security and then other general services that are integrated with your organization, you want to set up the service for the organization and then register a delegated administrator or register a member account that can manage that service on behalf of the organization. And again, the reason why we recommend doing this is you want to limit actions that are taken within the management account, delegate them out to member accounts within your organization so that you or your service teams can use those member accounts to take those actions as opposed to doing it at the management account. All right, I went through a lot, I went through a lot of it really quickly. Um, again, you can come back and review all of this later, but let's return back to the building manager and I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve. Thank you, Andrew. So the building manager, we have this building, it's secure, but the building manager is the one that sort of knows what's going on. They're the ones that are living in the building day to day and making sure that it's operationally sound. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, you know, again, the, the idea of operations, it's really the proof that you've set things up correctly in the beginning. So it's where the rubber meets the road. Um, it stress tests your organization, it stress tests your system, and, uh, and of course, you need to have the right telemetry and analytics in place to make sure that you know what's going on, that you have the eyes and ears of that building manager. Um, so uh, at AWS, operations is incredibly important to us, and we have sort of bubbled up a lot of uh, best practices. One thing that we've learned is one size does not fit all. You may know this already, but AWS is structured in a lot of small teams. So again, if you're in a small team, some of these truisms will apply to you, but also we operate at scale. So if you're looking to scale, these should help as best practices. The first one maybe sounds intuitive, but it really, really is important. I highly recommend having a single pane of glass as much as you can to have uh, your operations managed. The reason that's so important is most customers will have several different sets of tools, and even toggling between different browser tabs and logins, all those kind of things, that adds some friction to your operations. So if you can find tools that have the single pane of glass that pulls everything together, that's a big win in your organization. Second one is around run books and automation. Again, might sound obvious, but when you think about MTTR and your ability to respond to something quickly, it's incredibly important. There is a huge difference between an outage that lasts for 30 seconds versus one that lasts for three minutes or 30 minutes or three hours. And so your ability to respond immediately, actually I should say your ability to detect and then respond immediately through automation is critical. You need to take time in your team sprints, in your development process to add in automation and run books so that when something goes wrong, which it always will, you can respond quickly and your customers won't be impacted. Um, another best practice that transcends any size organization is to make sure that you have this feedback loop. Some of our customers will have a team that uh, builds the software and applications team and then a different team that operates it, 
uh, sort of a, an operations team. Um, some of them, like at AWS, if, if you build it, you run it. Um, but it's really important that that feedback loop exists so that you can adjust your software behavior on production without deploying new software. We call these operational levers or sometimes feature flags. You need to build these things in ahead of time so that you might be able to, for example, ratchet up and down uh, the number of threads or the number of simultaneous uh, background tasks that are happening in your application. You need to predict the future operationally and build those dials and switches into your product so that you can operate at scale. Um, another thing that we've learned is the tools that you use really affect how you operate. I, you probably have heard of Conway's Law, which is the idea that you ship your org structure, so essentially your software mirrors the, the org structure. If you have three teams that are doing things, you're gonna have three subsystems in your, in your software. Um, the same thing is true on the operation side, but the tools that you use are going to actually affect how you operate. So um, when you look at our customers at AWS, and again, some of your customers are probably the same, we have startups, we have enterprise, we have hybrid, people that have some on-prem, um, but all of them together really take these three components, um, and, and they're really looking for tools that help them put these three things together. They wanna be application-specific, thinking about applications and customers, um, and they want to make sure that they have plenty of automation in place. And it all sort of fits together in a cloud ops model. So um, I told you I work on systems manager. Um, I'm gonna quickly show a highlight reel of some systems manager things. But really, AWS systems manager is a pretty amazing thing. Most of it's free. And, uh, and it really does enable that visibility and, and allow you to sort of remediate quickly and centrally with the tools that are built into systems manager. Um, so the demo here is, as I said, sort of a highlight reel. Um, so this is, we've already set up AWS organizations for this account. And it's gonna go into Systems Manager and do something called Quick Start. There's a lot to Systems Manager and Quick Start lets you get up and running very quickly. In that second column you'll see we're organized by organization. So these are based on policies that get ended up creating that are based on your AWS organizational structure. And setting that up instantly allows you to see across um, uh, regions, to see across accounts, if I'm logged in here as the primary account. And, um, and, and lets you have that sort of single pane of glass. So I'm gonna step back out here. Um, I'm gonna go into uh, Systems Manager Explorer, which allows me to dive a little bit deeper. So click into Systems Manager Explorer. And here, you can see the number of managed instances. You can see ops tasks that are assigned across the whole organization. And when you scroll down here, um, you're gonna be able to see uh, uh, across, and it, again, I've obfuscated some of the account numbers for security, but you can see there's different account numbers there, different regions there, and this, again, allows you to look across your whole organization because you've set it up correctly with AWS organizations in the first place, and you can see your inventory of, of, uh, of instances here. Um, and then I'm gonna click into um, some uh, non-compliance pieces here, so you may be wanting to dive deep on uh, on your compliance situation, it's uh, broken out by uh, time frame and click in here to uh, 15 days past compliance. And again, using Explorer, you can take a look and look across all of these accounts, all of these regions, and see the compliance status of all of them. So again, back to the theme of setting things up correctly from the beginning, and then layering on top of that an operational tool of Systems Manager um, allows you to scale. So Andrew and I have been talking about good best practices, but really the question is how will you take this information and use it at home? Um, the best way for us to sort of instruct that, I think, is to have Bianca talk about how Warner Brothers Discovery uses it at home. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Bianca. Thank you, Steve. So let's talk about how we got there. So um, if you're familiar with Warner Brothers Discovery, we actually went through a major merger earlier this year. Discovery and Warner Media merged into a global entertainment company that's available in multiple countries and languages and is home to some iconic brands that you might have seen or heard about. Um, I came from the discovery world where we were an early cloud adopter. I don't know if anybody's heard that term, but there's a curse of an early adopter because a lot of these tools that we're talking about that are amazing were not necessarily available or mature at the point where they are now. And when you're first getting into the cloud, it's always, the advice has always been just get there, get your workloads working, talk about governance later. So we started with a handful of multi-tenant accounts and there was organic 
growth in the cloud, business transformation to digital posture to direct to consumer, smaller M&A activities, security teams growing, all of these things were converging at the same time. So we really had to step back and figure out how are we going to get cloud governance automation and that account lifecycle maturity level to be able to support this incredible growth. And this really works whether you have go, or you're going from 10 accounts to 100 or if you're going from 100 to 1,000. That is that scale. That can be huge or it can be small, but you have to consider how you will be at that scale. So what do we have to do? We had to figure out how we're going to get to self-service. We couldn't be in a place where we could wait for engineers, developers that were working on high-end, high-value systems to wait for an IT team to deliver them an account. There had to be a vending machine. There had to be um, ability to deliver something that is governed, secure, and everybody felt comfortable with it. So first thing we did, it's a lot less about using these products. It's much more about how our team handled it. We established a very productized approach to cloud governance, treating ourselves like a software team. And we developed what are our features, what did we have to deliver. We had a model for accounts. So talking about these multi, the multi-account strategy, we had an automated life cycle. Our delivery was transparent. We were working with engineers on the ground in their JIRA tickets. Uh, we established accountability and ownership, and mo most importantly, delivered our accounts with a base set of policies. There's that starting small. So kind of that, that life cycle looks like our framework's in the middle. Our central cloud team is delivering the accounts. We're leveraging AWS orgs and uh, we're delivering our accounts with owners and service control policies. So let's talk about that dedicated team and why that's important. That's really important not to overlook that you need a team to look after this. I look at it as this cloud platform is what my team owns. We let our individual users do what they need to do in their accounts, but we look after the posture and the life cycle. So the team is comprised of highly skilled engineers and solution architects and a program and a project manager. And they are curating all of these services for us. You don't go in and use every little thing in the service. You figure out what it works for your organization. Um, so we're responsible for the account lifecycle, record keeping, onboarding, and closure of accounts. And this productized approach allows us to customize all the controls for various business units. If you go back to the slide of number of brands we have, one size does not fit all. So how do you govern at scale? You use productized governance. It's more than a set of policies. Um, no one ever gets excited about policies and pushing papers around. We, we have an agile framework that is treated like any other software product for automation, testing, and releases. So there's that discipline and rigor that you might be used to as a software team. Um, also having governance as a team that has representation with the, from the business side allows this to stay a priority. So people can't say, no, you can't apply this policy. Uh, it is baked into everything we're doing. So we talked a lot about, we've heard a lot about um, AWS orgs and lots of best practices. This was probably version one of something we started with, a sample which has evolved much more over time. But again, you have your root, you have your base um, organizational units, you have your workloads, uh, all have prod and non-prod. Um, you have policy staging, we have suspensions, which is unbelievable in an MA activity for brownout. Uh, because anytime you're looking for owners of something where people have departed, it's amazing how nobody wants to take responsibility. But when you turn off their um, access to something and intentionally break it quickly, uh, people really speak up. But we have default set of policies that's applied. Um, our account automation delivers certain policies, again, that were curated to something we were doing. And this, the, this is different for everyone, and this is the key of having the team that has cloud expertise and engineering expertise to really be able to dig in and set up a correct um, OU structure for you. So account lifecycle, really, really important to have a feature set. So it's easy to provision an account. There's not a whole lot of effort there. 
provisioning it correctly with a default feature set is important. Um, eliminating noise between corporate teams and if somebody owns um, messaging or access to emails, having all the best practices baked in in a dramatic way, um, obscuring it from development teams was really key. So we did this as discovery, having no idea that a huge merger was ever gonna come at this scale. Um, this allowed for a lot easier integration of two massive uh, companies coming together. Prior to that, we dealt with some smaller ones and we had an ability to test uh, taking additional customers in and really moving them into the one centralized organization we had. Uh, they, these organizational units are specifically created as a landing spots for newly acquired uh, business units. So this is kind of the onboarding or M&A section. They're immediately able to get some base policies, but not too many uh, until we figure out what's in there. We find the right application owners. And as business decisions are made around the newly acquired companies, accounts are moved gently to appropriate business units. Let's kind of talk about this. What does this look like if you just combine one org into two? Um, you have to apply the least amount of policies. This is why it's, again, team curating and understanding and taking the time to understand what we're getting. It is very difficult to test the unknown. So slapping a policy and it, uh, hoping it would work, it's really hard. We, we may see what the infrastructure is, but we don't know what's actually, what, what's the business criticality of that system. Uh, we have that feedback loop. So having a development team being your cloud team works then with the development teams in that same tooling um, and their same environments. So that trust is established immediately. Uh, it's t tough when your governance coming up uh, after someone, the immediate answer is no. But if you kind of build that ground level relationship, it really helps move things forward. And we always had an extremely strong partnership with cloud security teams and our finance teams so that we can all together look at what it takes to govern um, a whole new setup. So we, we, taught, we heard a lot about various services in AWS. Again, the key here is like systems manager is huge, right? So here's kind of some samples of what we use across the board for the things we found it works for us. Um, patch manager for compliance scanning, parameter store. This is just a taste of it. Um, and again, we don't go all in. We kind of figure out what we're capable of handling and what we feel comfortable with. So what are our final business outcomes? So governance is treated like a software product. I don't think I can say that enough. Um, even with major disruptions of M&A activities, the business continues to, uh, continues to operate seamlessly. We've achieved significant cost savings by combining things at the top level, like CloudTrail, um, which led into immediate million dollar savings a year. But if you think about, you saved it this year, you've prevented that spend going forward, which was just wasted, you really actually are contributing to this whole financial picture. Um, and the most important thing is having a centralized view into your company's cloud posture. Some of our best practices use AWS organizations. To have a dedicated team to manage automation for account life cycle, fight for it too. Don't let the cost cuts get that. Um, have that team, have them be responsible for that account life cycle, OUs, and service control policies. All of these services are gonna come out with more features and having this team curate it and be ahead of the game is gonna be critical for any other scale that you may not think about is gonna happen. Using the service control policies um, for security baselines and overall business baselines and determine that basic set of policies to start with base, based on risk and business impact. So yeah, maybe we started here um, in this messy world. It's iterative. I don't think it's ever pretty, but um, you can get there. It takes time and it takes patience and it takes dedication to go from this to something much, much better. I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew, thank you. Thanks, Bianca. 
Uh, thanks, Bianca. It's really interesting to hear how Warner Brothers Discovery managed a lot of different scenarios and how they built that, that team. That team and that decision making, I think, is like we kind of went into some technical depth here, but we also like, spent a lot of time talking about sort of that team and that decision making, which really is sort of critical to, to make these decisions, to put these applications in place, to put the governance posture in place so that you can sort of continue to scale securely. Um, we've got a little bit of time, so I'm gonna spend just like three minutes talking a little bit more about mergers and acquisitions and kind of getting specifically into details around how to consider it. So we talked about building your environments, we talked about building your applications, the specific things that you want to consider when it comes to mergers and acquisitions is you have two environments already, and so you need to consider where the things are going to live within your combined environment. You need to consider where are the services that are hosted, so what are the services that you're using within your organizations, and where those are going to live in the new organization. And then there's a lot of billing considerations that you need to work through as well when it comes to all of your accounts are moving from one place to another, and so you need to save your billing history before making those moves. And so those are three different elements that we recommend when it comes to specifics around mergers and acquisitions in merging different organizations. And there's more to come in that world as we know that a lot of customers are doing this actively. And so we're actively building features to help make this a lot easier for our customers. But again, let's come back to where we started. We were in this environment, we had a few scattered accounts, we had a bunch of scattered users, the finance team didn't know what was going on, there wasn't a lot of visibility, there's a lot of risk in place, we didn't have any protocols or security controls in place and ultimately there was no governance or control. And where we are now, we've built our structure, it has a purpose, we have security and visibility in place, we've given tools to our building manager to be able to tweak and understand what's going on, and we're in a much better space than we were when we started. So when it comes to best practices and key takeaways, again, to review, you wanna plan an effective structure, you wanna think of accounts as bricks, and build an OU structure around those bricks. You want to limit access and use preventative controls where possible. You want to equip your teams with centralized tools so that if there's security, they have visibility. If there are operations, they can ensure that everything is operating efficiently. You want to build runbooks and automation and also build preventative feedback loops within your organization, within your accounts. So let's talk about some specific next steps that you can take. So if you haven't taken a photo of the best practices, I recommend doing that to revisit them in the future or review the recording. I'll give you 10, 15 seconds now. Start small and grow from there. So if you're a small business and you have a single account, create an organization, create a second account, create some separation there. If you're an organization with a few accounts but you really haven't gone into service control policies, Create a policy that prevents accounts from leaving the organization and test it out on a test account within the organization. Or utilize Control Tower and the preventative guardrails, which are managed policies from AWS. Or if you're a large organization, you have a bunch of organizational units, but you don't necessarily have an account, um, an account mechanism in place to provision accounts and provide ownership to it, as Discovery has shown us. That's some place where you can start and, and build that automation. But it, within any case, from startups to large enterprises, governance isn't something that happens overnight. I, took, I assume it took a few years for Bianca's use case here. It's making those decisions, putting those, that framework in place now, or starting to think about those decisions and putting that framework in place will set you up in the long run. Enable standardized security controls and operations for your team, and then ensure you build the right structure now in anticipation of your future growth. Sorry, I'll go back real quick. A few pictures still being taken. All right, there's a number of resources that explain a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today and dive really deep into the details. I highly recommend all of these resources for building your environment, building your security system, building your, your, system, your building manager's tools. And then, of course, if you want to see more from the cloud operations track, feel free to, to check out this QR code from the other tracks. And also, please be sure to complete the session survey. We really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. We pay attention to the surveys and the responses, and that helps produce better content for you and helps us as speakers as well. But thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it.